Good morning and welcome to City Hills Church Online. We are so excited to have you join us this morning. And listen, if you're new here, just write that in the comments so we could reach out to you, get to know you a little better, and you can get to know us. Today we're going to be closing out our series made new. And this is going to be such a great one. I tell you, I have been writing so many notes and the idea that's really stuck with me so far through this is my life is moving in the direction of my strongest thoughts. This is something that's really kind of revamped the way that I've been thinking through this season, how I'm thinking, how I'm speaking. So I know that we've gotten some great feedback and I know you're enjoying it. So today is going to be wonderful. Also, this week we got to do something really amazing. We got to meet with the, um, with the founders of uh, Alabaster Jar Project and be able to give them the Christmas offering, wait for it, $4,000. You guys surpassed what our goal was. Can I tell you, you are absolutely amazing. And they were so thrilled. They were so thrilled to be able to get this. They were blown away by it. We were also able to donate a whole case of uh, the intentional planners for the people at Grace House and for their staff as well. They, they're just, they just said to tell you, thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of their hearts. So um, because of your generous giving, we're able to do these things. You know, our heart is really to make an impact in our community. So if you wanna continue partnering with us, the links are all up here for you to go to. We would love to have you be a part of what we're doing here in San Diego. So join us now for some worship and I will see you back here after the sermon. A few weeks ago we shared this song with you. It's an oldie, but it's such a powerful song as we go into this new year that we proclaim that our God is able. Come on, let's sing this together. This God is able. He will never fail. He is almighty God. Greater than all we see. Greater than all we ask. He has done great things. Lifted up, defeated the grave, raised to life. Our God is able in His name. We overcome for the Lord. Our God is able. Come on, sing it. God is with us. God is with us. God is on our side. above all we know, far above all we hope, He has done great things, lifted up, He defeated the grave, raised to life, our God is able, in His name, we overcome. Oh, 
church we've made it we're in week four of our made new series and we've been looking at some really important truths that i feel like have been helping me and helping me evaluate some things in my life and here's the deal in week one i told you that you have permission to press time out to press pause on all of those new year's resolutions that you've made but the reality is after today we're on the clock Right, we're on the clock, not for some arbitrary New Year's resolutions, but we're on the clock because now we know what it takes for us to truly lean into being made new in this relationship with Jesus. And so I hope that over the last couple weeks, you've been able to grab a hold of some things that are, are helping you lean into that truth some more. And listen, there's this truth that just keeps bubbling up Every week, we, it just has become kind of this overarching pattern for us that we've walked through. And it's this truth that our thoughts lead to our actions, our actions lead to our habits, and our habits lead to our lifestyle. And it's the idea that as we think, we do. And as we do, we become habitual in it. And as it becomes a habit, it actually becomes a lifestyle of how we handle things in our lives. And so today we're going to be talking about our habits. We all have good habits. We all have bad habits. But leaning into what those habits are are really important as we close out this series. And so I wanted to be really transparent with you and honest. One of the areas that I have some really good habits and some really bad habits is in my weight loss journey. And so what happens for me, and maybe you guys are different, and if you are, kudos to you, but I know for me, I am on this like 20 pound roller coaster. My, my roller coaster is not like, oh, I gained five or six pounds and I don't feel good. So I lose those five or six pounds. And, and uh, no, mine is 20 pounds and it never fails. What happens is I'm going to get into the shower and it's been a stressful season. It's been a lot of things happening, whatever the excuse is. And I walk past the mirror and I go, oh, oh, wait a minute. And then later on, I go get on the scale and every single time it's the same exact panic weight. Every time I I have this ceiling that I hit and I'm like, whoa, dude, you've got to get back on the horse. What is going on? And so every time I, I hit that number, I panic and I go, okay, I know what I have to do to lose this weight. I'm going to lose this weight. And so every time it happens, I, I'm diligent. I'm disciplined. I'm focused. Lauren's like, I don't know how you're so disciplined. I'm like, what are you talking about? I just gained 20 pounds over the last six months. I'm not that disciplined, obviously. But when it comes to losing weight, when it comes to setting a goal and achieving it, I'm really, really good at that. I can stay focused, I can stay locked in, but the issue for me is that I don't know how to maintain that. Once I reach a goal, I'm kind of like the dog on up. I'm like, squirrel, 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 what's going on? Like, I just lose interest. Because what happens is I get to my target weight, and then for me, if I wanted to get to that like dream weight, like lose another 10 pounds 
And if I lost that 10 pounds, you wouldn't like me very much because I would preach shirtless, right? Like abs would be showing. I'd feel amazing. And I, I probably wouldn't be a nice person because it's like, dude, you're in the bank. Why didn't well, put your shirt on? But I know I can't get to that weight without absolutely changing everything. I'd have to change the way I work out. I'd have to change the way that I spent my day. I'd have to change the way completely how I eat. And honestly, it's just not worth that. It's not worth it for me because I want to enjoy life. I don't want to be thinking constantly about counting macros and making sure that I'm, I just, I want to just be healthy, right? And so I know that I'll never get to my dream weight. And because of that, I just kind of lose interest and I just kind of do whatever. And I celebrate being at my ideal weight by eating lots and lots of gluten-free sweets because that makes a whole lot of sense, right? But I, I get to this place where I've set a goal and I can be disciplined, but what I wanted right now has been achieved. And so now what I want is completely different and I lose momentum. Look at this truth. I think it's so important for us. Discipline is choosing between what you want now and what you want most. Have you ever really thought about it? What you want now is ever changing. What you want now, like for me, when I want to lose weight, it's what I want now. It's not that I want to be healthy. It's I want to lose weight now. I want to get to this number. And once I get there, then the goal changes. What matters to me changes. Once I hit that certain point, all momentum and energy is gone. And the reality is that our, our now, what we want now, is, is constantly changing. It's based on where we are relationally, financially, spiritually, mentally. What we want now is constantly changing. But for most people, if we thought about it, what we want most is usually pretty stable, right? Think about it. What most people want the most is to be happy, happy, to be healthy, to be purposeful, to feel like they're waking up with this drive and this purpose in their day, to, to be financially stable. I know some of you, your, your goal is to be as rich as possible, but for most people, it's just to be financially stable where you don't have to wake up in the morning and worry about if the car breaks down. Like you just want to be at a place where everything is good. And for many of us, what we want most is to be at peace mentally, that our mind would finally be quiet. So what do you want most? When you think about it, it brings us back to our habits because what we're going through dominates our thoughts. And what dominates our thoughts starts to interact and change the way that we behave. And the way that we behave leads to the habits we form in our lives. And before we realize it, what's happened is that you and I develop a pattern in the way that we handle successes, the way that we handle opportunities, challenges, and even failures. So what's your pattern? Think about it. Like if you were to pull back from your, your life, if you were to zoom out, what's your pattern for handling things? Think about it, honestly. It's something that's important for you to evaluate in your life. When you have something successful, something good that happens in your life, what's your pattern? You know, I, I call my mom, I call my friends, I call, I do this, I go that, I celebrate with dinner, I go and buy a car, I go buy a yacht. I don't, I don't know what you do. <laughs> what, what is your pattern when something bad happens, when that massive hospital bill comes in out of nowhere, when you lose your job, when there's a, a death in the family? What is your pattern for handling that? I think it's so important for us to evaluate those things because it'll, it'll speak to our thought processes and it'll speak to the way that we behave because the way that we establish these patterns is based on all of those things. And it stems from what we want most versus what we really want now. Actually, believe it or not, the Apostle Paul talks about this in his letter to the Christians in Rome. And I just love his transparency. And I think you and I, you, you'll be able to relate to it as I have. Romans 7, starting in verse 15. 
I love the message version of this uh, passage of scripture. It explains it so, so well. He says, I'm full of myself. After all, I've spent a long time in sin's prison. What I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way, but then I act another, doing things I absolutely despise. So if I can't be trusted to figure out what's best for myself and then do it, it becomes obvious that God's command is necessary. I think that's so important for us. If you and I have proven our pattern, our track record says, even if we know what we should do and we can't do it, it proves to us even more how much we need God's commands in our lives because obviously we can't do it on our own. Verse 17, but I need something more. For if I know the law, but I still can't keep it, and if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. Something has gone wrong deep within me, and it gets the better of me every time. Isn't this amazing? This is this is the Apostle Paul. It feels like almost every week we're looking at one of his letters, and he's going, guys, I'm really bad at this. I don't want to do something, but somehow I do it and I'm frustrated. I obviously need help. I need help because I know what's right and I still don't do it. He's speaking to, to what we've been talking about. There's a difference between head knowledge and living it out. It speaks to our desires and what's driving us. Verse 21, it happens so regularly that it's predictable, almost like a pattern right? The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. I truly delight in God's commands. I I truly love the Lord, but it's pretty obvious that not all of me joins in that delight. Part of me covertly rebels, and just when I least expect it, they take charge. I've tried everything. Nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? How many of you have been there? How many of you can relate with Paul? I know that I can. That the moment that I choose to do good, the moment that I choose to be a better husband, the moment that I choose to be a a better spouse, right? Maybe for you, the moment you choose to drink less, to, to spend less, to make better decisions, to fight less, to be a better spouse, to be a better friend, the moment that you decide, I want to be closer to the Lord, the moment that happened, sin is there to trip you up. It's so relatable. You relate with Paul that there's these covert areas of your life that right as you're deciding to do good, they just pop out of nowhere. They pop out of those hidden chambers of your heart and they trip you up with the sin. They trip you up with these things that you don't want to do, but somehow you still end up doing them. Look at this truth. When our desires lead our decisions, Life can spiral out of control. This is why this is why Jesus is so passionate about getting to the the desires of your heart. This is why Jesus is so passionate about getting to every aspect of your life. It's not because he's some authoritative ruler that just wants to be in complete control, but he understands that those small areas of our life that aren't given to him, that they, those are the areas that covertly sabotage our purpose. This is why we have to burn the old couch. This is why we have to burn the old life. This is why we have to get rid of those things so we can fully embrace the new that Jesus offers us. Second Timothy three says it this way. And guys, I feel like this is just a perfect picture of our society. And it's amazing that this was written thousands of years ago. Second Timothy three. 
starting in verse one. You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times for people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. Man, isn't that so true of our society right now? Verse three, they will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that can make them godly. Timothy, stay away from people like that. Listen, there's an important truth that you need to understand. There is a big difference between being spiritual and being surrendered. There's a huge difference in your life between being spiritual versus being fully surrendered to Jesus. Guys, we're surrounded by a bunch of spiritual people. We're surrounded by people who believe in having good energy and, and having good motives and being a good person and having good causes and having all of We're surrounded by people who feel like they're spiritual. Maybe they watch church once a month online or, or maybe they, they go, they, they used to go to church and, and they read their Bible and they pray every once in a while. And it's this idea, well, I'm, I'm spiritual. Like I'm trying to be a good follower of Jesus. No, no, no. There's a difference between being spiritual and being surrendered. Surrendered means there's not an area of your life that is hidden from God. There's not an area of your life that you haven't said, Jesus, have it all. Guys, it's so much more than just being a good person. It's so much more than being spiritually aware. It's being surrendered. The difference between us and everyone else in the world is that we have a risen savior that we can surrender our life to and go, Jesus, I cannot do this without you. I want you to have it all. In order for us to be made new guys, we have to surrender it all. It's so much deeper. I don't want to be the kind of follower of, of Jesus that is spiritual, but lacks the power that comes with that relationship because I haven't fully surrendered it all to him. We've got to surrender it all if we ever hope to experience the fullness of the relationship he offers. Look at this truth. We, we have to understand that, that we must develop what God has deposited, that God has deposited incredible things into your life, incredible potential into your life. But we have a responsibility to develop that. It's more than just, oh, I was given these gifts and these talents. I was given these abilities to do this and to do that. And, and it's more than that. Congratulations, we're all chosen, we're all set apart, we all have incredible purpose in our life, but we have to do the work to develop it. We have to work on it. There's never been a moment in my life that I felt this truer than when I was taking night classes when Lauren and I first got married. See, I, I promised her dad that she would graduate even though we were getting married young. And so in order to keep that up, because we were young and broke, I had to work full time and then I would take night classes while she was uh, in school full time and, and she had a, a part time job as well. And so I would go to these night classes and one of them was a speech class. And for most people, they were so afraid of going to these speech classes. They, one of the greatest phobias for the majority of our society is public speaking. Well, obviously for me, that's not really a phobia. That would be kind of a, a struggle in kind of the role that I'm in, right? And so I was pretty stoked about it. I'm like, this is gonna be an easy A, I've got this. And so I'm in, I'm in this class and true to form, Everyone is panicking. Everyone is struggling. And this girl next to me, she goes and she's given one of her first speeches. And guys, I'm, I'm trying to be as nice as I possibly can. But I mean, I think at one point we were like chanting her name so she would keep going. Like it was just rough. She barely made it through it. It was brutal. And so she sits down next to me and I take a little peek and on her paper, she got like a B plus. And I'm like, money. This class is gonna be a breeze. I cannot wait. So 
I got up, I did my speech, and honestly, I just mailed it in. It was so mediocre. It was just, I didn't put a whole lot into it. I just got through the motions. I'm like, this is, this is gonna be too easy. And I did not give my best whatsoever. But I'm not, I'm not trying to be conceited, but it, it was easily one of the better ones in the class, right? Because Not because I'm some eloquent speaker, but because everybody else just struggled. And so when I got to my seat, I was expecting to see a hundred, and what I got was a B minus. And I was like, what? Like I almost lost it in the class. I'm like, what is going on? So for the last 45 minutes, I'm kind of fuming. I'm sitting there like, what What in the world is happening here? You get me lower than homegirl that we had to chant her name so she can finish halfway through her speech? And so I waited till everyone was gone and I went to the teacher and I was like, hey, listen, what's going on? How did I get a B minus? I don't I don't really get it. I I felt like my speech was one of the better ones that that we all gave tonight. And she said, listen, Mr. Henderson, it's obvious that you have potential. It's obvious that you're good at this. And I think your expectation is that I'm grading you against everyone else but I'm not grading you against them. I'm grading you versus your own potential. So do better. And it was like this slap in the face of, oh, well, all right. And so the rest of the class, I got hundreds the rest of the way. And it was, it was awesome. I enjoyed that class. But it was a reminder, and it's something that I remember on a consistent basis. Listen, God's not looking at me and judging my potential versus someone else. God's not looking at my purpose and going, well, I mean, if you were a little bit more like Susie. No, God's looking at us. He's looking at you. He's looking at me, and he's going, hey, don't you know what I deposited in you? Come on, I know you have more. I don't care what everybody else is doing. I don't care if you're living a little bit better than them. I don't care if you're you're not making the same mistakes and you're not having the same struggles and you're not, I don't care about what's happening with them right now. I'm talking about you. Because when I'm talking with them, I'm worried about them. But with you, I want to call out that potential. And I, I wonder how many times we miss the fact that God is not judging us against the rest of the class. That God is looking at us going, hey, don't you know what I deposited? Why don't you spend the time to develop that? Listen, friends, we have an opportunity to do better. Like that teacher told me, hey, you, you've obviously got some potential at this. Do better. Don't mail it in. It's obvious. Do better. You and I have an opportunity to do better, to live better, to think better. The opportunity is there for us if we surrender to Jesus and we surrender our ways of doing things and go, hey, God, I need you to take control. I want to be made new. And there's something that I, I found true in my life. And, and as we're wrapping up today, I hope that you will experience the same thing. And it's this truth that one healthy habit can be contagious, right? I, I know for me, if I can just get one healthy habit back, when I'm completely out of rhythm, if I can get one healthy habit back, it, it spurs me in all of the other areas of my life. And I know for most of you, you think, okay, yeah, yours is, is, you know, your quiet time with the Lord. If once you get that right and you're, you're all set, actually it's not. Honestly, for me, the one healthy habit that when I have it established, it kind of gives momentum to every other area of my life. It is working out. When I'm working out, I'm putting those good chemicals in my brain. My, my mentality is better. My energy is better. My relationship with people is better. My stress is lower. And it gives me that momentum and that freedom. It, it kind of kicks everything back into gear that my relationship with God actually gets better when I'm working out consistently. You're like, Danny, that's weird. I'm just telling you how it works for me. And for you, you have to figure out what that one healthy habit is that just keeps the engine rolling. What is that, what is that healthy habit that's going to keep things moving? Because I know for me, when I'm doing mine, it, it just it helps me be more disciplined in every area of my life. I know because I'm working out, I don't want to waste that time that I worked out eating a bunch of junk. So I eat better. 
because I eat better, I feel better. Because I feel better, I can wake up better. Because I wake up better, I can spend more time with the Lord and be more engaged with him and connected with him. And and when my stress level is low, my focus is higher. All of that stems from one healthy habit. So what is your one healthy habit? What's your one healthy habit? What do you need to start right now? And in order for you to discover that, you need to ask yourself this question, what do I want most? Reflect on that. What do I want most? Not, not just what do I want now, but what do I want most? For, for some of you, maybe it's a healthy marriage. You want a, a healthy marriage. That's what you need most. Like if that was if that was stable, if that was going good, if you and your spouse were on the same page, everything else in your life would feel better. So what are the what are the habits that you need to do? Maybe it's a date night. Maybe it's turning Netflix off and sitting there with a cup of coffee at the end of the night and just talking, just communicating with each other, just having a conversation talking about something more than your schedule. Actually talk about what's going on in your life. Maybe for some of you, it is losing weight. Maybe it is, you're similar to me, that when you're, when you're in that healthy habit of working out, then all of a sudden everything else starts to fall into place. Maybe for some of you, it, it's the thing that you need the most, that you want the most is that promotion because you know it'll create some leadership and creativity freedom for you to do what you need to. Or maybe it represents some freedom in your schedule. And maybe it, it, it just it will give you financially the ability to, to do some things, to pay off some debt, to to be able to let your spouse work less. And then they would be in a like what what is what is it that you need the most? Maybe for some of you, it is you need to be closer to God. And so that's what you need the most. That's what you want the most. And so you have to focus on the healthy habits that establish that for you. Listen, I have to share with you as a pastor, closeness to God is going to be the key to everything. We're, there's no way we can live out these principles and be like, OK, God, I heard it one time in a sermon. So while I may say my one healthy habit is working out. It is spurring on my relationship with God, right? Like it's, they're not separate from each other. I'm just telling you, 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 you're not able to do these things without that proximity to God. Maybe for you, it's this year, this 18 months have been so brutal. So what you need most is to be mentally healthy. Maybe for some of you, it's, it's to break your addiction to porn. Maybe for some of you, it's to break your addiction to getting into more and more debt. You need to get out of debt desperately. What do you want most? And what is the one healthy habit that gets you there? Guys, listen, I don't want us to be the kind of church. I don't want us to be the kind of followers of Jesus that we're spiritual and we sound the right way and we do a few of the right things, but we're not surrendered to Jesus. He wants to make your life brand new. Will you give him that chance? Will you give him the opportunity to change everything in your life? Will you surrender it to him? For those of you that haven't made that decision, you've, maybe you've heard a few of these messages and you think, well, that all sounds good. I, I, need, I need a fresh start. I need to be made new. Start with beginning that relationship with Jesus. Pray the simple prayer that says, Jesus, I've been doing this on my own. Like this, whoever this Apostle Paul dude is that Danny's talking about, I feel like him. I want to do good, but I keep doing wrong. I want to live with purpose, but I, I keep falling under the same thing. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Jesus, I believe you are who you say you are. I believe you are the son of God. I believe you died on the cross. I believe you rose again. I believe that one day you're coming back. Jesus, I want to surrender my life to you. I want you to be the leader of my life. I hope for some of you, you will pray that prayer today that you would take that step. Maybe you prayed that prayer years ago when you were a kid, and today you need to rededicate your life to that. You need to just set your heart again, focused on surrendering it all to him. Guys, we have so much potential, and I want to see you develop it. I want you to develop what God has deposited in your life. 
And it starts with surrendering it all. And then from there, you can allow the Lord to change your thoughts, to change the way you act, to change your habits. And then all of a sudden, you're standing there and your whole life looks brand new. That's my prayer for you. That's my hope for you. So come on together. Let's pray. Let's pray that God would do that in your life right now. Heavenly Father, Lord, this this idea of our thoughts into our actions, our actions into our habits, our habits into our lifestyle has just is rang so true time and time again throughout this series. And so, Jesus, I pray with authority. I pray in the name of Jesus that you would fix our thoughts, that you would renew our minds, that you would put a steadfast spirit within us, God, that you would bring healing and hope and clarity to our thoughts and to our hearts. God, I pray that you would just allow our souls to be mended by what it is that you're doing. Jesus, I know in this season we've seen so many people that this isolation, this time away from everything, this break from the norm has brought up and it's stirred up these old things that haven't been dealt with. So in the name of Jesus, I pray for healing, for clarity and for strength. God, that you would renew our minds so that we can be made new in your spirit. Jesus, I pray that that as our minds are changed, as our souls are changed, as our hearts are changed, as our desires line up with your desires, that our behaviors would begin to match it that we would be recognized the opposite of those words in Timothy, that we would be people who are not puffed up and proud and, and abandoning everything that is sacred. Jesus, that we would be the kind of people that hold strong to what it is that you've called us to, that we hold on, like Paul said, that we need your commands. It's so obvious that we need your leadership in our life because we obviously can't do it on our own. And God, as our behaviors change, that you would fix our habits. Jesus, we want to be the kind of people that our habits reflect the people we want to be. We want to be the kind of people that our habits reflect your mission and your name in the world. God, help renew and make brand new within us those habits in our life. Give every person hearing these words clarity on the habit that they need to start, whether that it's it's beginning with their day with time with you, whether that habit is is figuring out ways that they can daily surrender their lives to your leadership or whether it's just simply working out so that it can create the momentum that they need to, to spur into all these others. And Jesus, as we close out this series, I pray that you would make our lives brand new. God, we burn the old, we leave it behind, and we embrace the new that you have promised. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. That was amazing. I really love the part about discipline being a choice between what you want now or what you want most. That one really settled in with me today, and I, I, I'm sure that it did with you as well. So here's our challenge for this week. What one healthy habit are you willing and able to start today? And honestly, that really reminds me of when I was uh, training people. It's such a, a great reminder because, you know, when you're wanting to change your lifestyle, you're wanting to do something that's so different and out of the ordinary of what you're doing, you want to do all the things. And honestly, if you choose one healthy habit, it can be the start and the step to changing so many other things. And that goes with our health, it goes with our, our, our mind, it goes with how we live our life. Choose one healthy habit that you can start today and you won't feel like you have to wait till everything is perfect before you can get started. So I hope that's something that can, that can really resonate with you and stay with you this week. So we're gonna say goodbye for now, but listen, we are going to be on Facebook Live this Saturday at 9 a.m. We're finishing out, we're almost done with our 21 days of prayer. We really have been hoping and praying that you guys have gotten as much out of it as we have just dedicating that time to prayer. It's, it's something that will absolutely change our lives. If there's anything we can pray with you about during the week, if not, we will see you on Saturday morning, 9 a.m., right here on Facebook Live. Have a great week. We love you.